So, um, well, it's good to have friends up here, and especially friends in the in the film world. You, um, we, we, you have a long illustrious career. You are you're sort of part of a community of people uh, that were around in the heyday of independent film. Yeah. Right in the '90s, you were working at New Line, or was yeah. it even earlier than that? It was earlier. It ended in the '90s. It was the mid '80s to mid '90s. So and that really is when there was just a lot of money happening around compared to any other time. <laughs> you know, it was it was an extraordinary time, and. Um, as my ex-husband says, we all got the last golden ticket. And I believe that to be true. Sure. Let's just say your ex-husband. My ex-husband is the filmmaker, David O. Russell. And this, this, story, this will come in because I, I, we were very involved with um, getting his career going. I produced right. his first feature. And so it was, it's part of the story. It's part of the narrative. Of and that was that of course. New Line, his first? Uh, it was distributed through Fine Line. We made it totally Fine. independently. We funded it for $40,000. Shot it on short ends from... Uh, House Party Three that I executive produced and I grabbed the short ends, and um, you know it was all hands on deck. It's you know, guerrilla filmmaking the way that first features are typically made when they're genuinely independent. And we took a bunch of uh, really kids. We were all kids, you know, uh, up to Pauling, New York, in upstate New York. Where? Where Pauling, New York, is a yeah. town in upstate New York, and uh, it's about an hour from where we are. Okay. And um, David's. Former college roommate had grown up there, and his wife was kind of like oh, his wife, his mother. Sorry, <laughs> his mother was like the doyen of the town. And so, which by the way, I'm giving little tips to those of you who are out there wanting to uh, make your first features, is that we had this woman who was like the connector at Pauling, New York, and she just thought this was a great lark and a lot of fun. What an adventure to help these kids make their first film. And so she reached out to her community uh, and we quickly had a lot of resources at our disposal. We found our hero location, uh, people who are willing to put the crew up, uh, paved the way to get permits, yada, yada, yada. So we took everybody up for, I think it was 17 days um, to upstate New York in the middle of the hot steamy summer and um, put everybody up in a hotel. David made, now this was really a long time ago, right? So he made a video of the hotel. This is back when people were just starting to do video, right? So he made a promotional video of the hotel in exchange for free rooms at the hotel. So there was a barter going on. Right. And, um, you know, and then friends and family just like contributed and we shot this film and nobody, everybody was deferred. All the payments were deferred. But what we did is we gave a crew of 20 year olds an opportunity to get the hell out of New York City in the middle of the heat, to have like summer camp, right? With each other yeah. in a beautiful town upstate New York. And also we gave people an opportunity to, to bump up. So if you had been an assistant, you got to be the department. It was a opportunity, there was a work incentive, uh, it was deferred payments so we could afford it, there's a chance to get out of town and it was really fun. And um, I did locations and catering. <laughs> and it was one of the producers that put together the funding and we raised money from friends and family. You know, there was no such thing as crowdsourcing back then, but we essentially did crowdsourcing without the, sure. the where what we did is we created an LLC, which is still being done, created an LLC and we sold shares at $500 a share to oh. friends and family. And, oh. um, and, and we're able to, to, to raise about, <clears throat> we raised more than half of it. Now, David had had an NEA grant way back in the, we were really talking way back then. National this Endowment is, Grant. A National Endowment Grant, which they don't give anymore for individual filmmakers, but they gave it to David for a project that he, switched he did no longer wanted to make it so he substituted this script for the other one but didn't get actual permission to do it and we oh, knew that was a little bit hey guerrilla filmmaking right so we used the twenty thousand dollars and then showed them the movie afterwards and they're like no mm -mm, gotta give the money back <laughs> and this movie was spanking the monkey which went on to win many awards uh it was a big sundance hit it would got the the two awards at the um you know, the, the, I have, no, the what are they called? Hmm, the the Spirit the Awards, Spirit the Awards. Independent Spirit Awards. Right. And it launched his illustrious career. And yes. yet the NEA was like, we don't like this film. Give us the money. <laughs> it's okay. But we were fortunate because we premiered the film at Sundance. It was totally independent. New Line knew about the film. A little bit of history. Uh, when David and I, before David and I were married, when we were dating, um, I read the script. I thought it was brilliant. And 
I, I knew it was not a film that, and that New Line would ever make, but I felt because of my position there, I was at that time the senior VP of production development, creative position. It was my job to run the New York creative staff. There was right. an LA office. Is that what you're saying? No, so, so I wanna just sort of give you context. Please do. That sure. at that time, I was an, a key executive at New Line Cinema. Now New Line Cinema is a large production entity with the capacity to produce and distribute. They had created, recently created at that time, a smaller entity within New Line called Fine Line that was to only acquire, not fund, not develop, not produce, but only acquire to distribute more kind of specialized market films. Okay, so I was an executive at New Line and our mandate was to make the more commercial genre films. I was responsible for a series of the, the House Party series. That's a project that I brought in and oversaw, hence our ability to get the short ends, et cetera. Because I was a key executive running the creative development for the New York office of New Line Cinema, there was also an LA West Coast office, I knew that I really needed to tell them about this project that at the time David and I were gonna make, we, we just were gonna make this happen. <clears throat> and so I brought it and did, we did what's called weekend read. So everybody out there, what ha here's what happens at studios or large production companies. The executives on Friday present the projects that they think are worth the attention of their colleagues that, we, that the, the company should seriously consider investing time and resource. And so I put Spanking the Monkey, the script for Spanking the Monkey, David's first feature, into the weekend read, thinking that I'm just covering my butt. Everybody will read it, say, we love it, but we're gonna pass, that's that. Well, lo and behold, we come in on Monday. Everybody goes home, do the weekend reads. Monday morning, you have your conference call. And, and Bob Shea, the founder and CEO of New Line Cinema, had read the script because he had somebody told him this was my boyfriend. So he was kind of curious. He was like, mm. I love this. I want us to make it. I'm like, really? <laughs> wow. Because this was not house party, right? This is for those who haven't seen it. And I hope that you'll go out and seek it out now, although I'm not sure it's in distribution anymore. Um, it's a it's a very dark comedy. Oh, very very, it has like David's kind of quirky voice um, about a teenager who has sex with his mother. Ooh. I don't see where the dark part comes in, but go ahead. Yeah, I know, I know. What's not to like? Uh, so, um, Jeremy, uh, the actor. So, yeah, Jeremy Davies. It ended up being yeah. Jeremy Davies' first role. But anyway, so at this point, it was just a script with David attached to direct. He had never directed a feature, a few Sundance, a few shorts that had been at Sundance, which is how he and I had met. And Bob Chase says, okay, I really want to make this film. I'm like, all oh, right. So they optioned it in for a year. New Bob really in great earnest tried to get an actor, an actress, we used to call them, a female actor of yes. enough renowned to justify a million dollar budget and make sense for overseas foreign and domestic distribution so that it would make sense for the company to fund it. And in great earnest, he tried. And it just didn't happen. Of course it didn't happen. What right. No, no, even if an act, let me guess that even if an actress wants to do it, her agent is not going to let her do it. Right. So, her job to prevent her from doing that role. And, <laughs> right? here's, yes, and here's why. Here's why. It's not that they're being mean. It's because, and certainly at that time, and we're talking 1990, certainly at that time, if you were lucky enough to still be considered a viable market value actress when you were 40. Right you were holding on by a thin thread. This was big risk. This was yeah. risky material by an unknown filmmaker. It could have gone so south so fast and been such a horrible movie. And he, David actually went out, flew to LA and had a meeting with Faye Dunaway. And she came really close to doing, but the end was like, no. And who can blame her? So when all that fell apart, the option expired and David and I decided, well, we're just gonna make this. So we made it for those resources that I just described, $40,000, upstate New York, shot a few days. It went to Sundance, it premiered there. And at that point in time, Fine Line, which was run by Ira Deutschman, acquired it for distribution. So New Line, Fine Line did not develop, did not fund, but acquired it for distribution once it had been made. And once the proof of concept, because, and this is something that I think filmmakers really need to understand, when you're making a kind of an auteur driven movie that's very much about personal voice and vision, you have to show what your personal voice and vision is. It's wholly execution dependent, right? And so it's hard to ask people to put high risk money, time and resource into a project where there's, you know, it could go bad so fast. 
So I think that it's right and fair that the first films of people who have strong voice and vision should be made, you know? I think that there's a kind of um, Darwinian <laughs> aspect to it, you know? If you have the determination, not just the talent, not just the vision, but the determination and the kind of the stuff, you know, the real stuff, it's gonna happen, you'll, make, you'll get it made. And yeah. there's a kind of a, you know, a rooting out of those who just, should go off and do something else with their lives. And what happened to that grant money uh, ultimately? We had to pay it back. So when it was acquired, when, when Spanking the Monkey was acquired by Fine Line, the yes. good news is that we got an advance. And so we we're able to pay back the NEA grant and pay everybody's salaries who had been deferred. And, um, and we actually were able to reimburse the friends and family who had bought shares. So just to explain to the audience out here, here's a big difference. When you do crowdfunding, that's not recoupable. In other words, anybody who makes a donation to your crowdfunding does so really in exchange for maybe they get a movie poster or whatever. Right. They're, they're, not, not, they're not investors. They, are investors. Not, they do not have an equity investment. They're right. not shareholders. Getting, getting... They're not shareholders. So to be clear, our investors were not producers. They were shareholders in an LLC that funded the movie. And so they had a position to we get their investment back with profit. And so we were accountable to that. Now, had it not made any money, they would not have recouped their money, but that's that. That's a risk you take when you invest in an equity venture. When you're out there crowdsourcing for friends and family, they'll give you money and they don't expect anything in return. They'll expect, you know, one of the perks and bonuses. They are not equity investors in your project. So to you as a filmmaker, or as a producer, that's an advantage because you're not accountable to give any money back if you were to make a big sale. Right. 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 They get the uh, thank you and the credit roll. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. As do all the investors that, who put in equity into a film. Right. They don't get it. And I, was I mean, sometimes. Go ahead, Go ahead. Yeah, just, just to clarify that sometimes. Um, a credit will be given in exchange for an equity investment. That's also very typical when you're funding a film that somebody comes in and says, well, you're asking for, you know, I'll become a major shareholder in the LLC. I'll, I'll, I'll put in like, you know, 40% of the budget. Well, at that point, then they have earned themselves an executive producer credit or an associate producer or co-producer or something like that. Uh, and I was trying, I was uh, panicking for, trying to figure out, remember who played the uh, mom, Jeremy's mom in the- Yes, um, a beautiful Canadian actress who has died. And um, I'm embarrassed to say that her name is escaping me at this exact moment, I'm having a horrible- Alberta? Yeah. Alberta. Watson? Alberta Watson, she's a, yeah. she's a wonderful, she did a beautiful, be she was a lovely woman. She did a beautiful job and she died, you know, about eight, nine years ago, yeah. And Jeremy Davies, the way that that casting happened is that, you know, David had been auditioning a lot of people, nobody was quite right. And uh, we were home, we were watching TV and there was an ad for a Jeep, a Jeep commercial was on and there was a kid in the Jeep commercial ad. Really? And it, it was him. Really? So. Well, did he identify what it was about Jeremy? Because he, he definitely has a, you, such a unique presence and, yeah. uh, you know, has managed through that, through the many decades now, to to maintain a great career, because you know, because it's more than just a tick kind of thing, which it could have been, but it's yeah, it could have been more, right. Yeah. You know. So I mean, I'm I'm a real believer that it takes talent to spot talent. You know, if you spot it, you got it. And so I think that's why there's you know a long history of filmmakers identifying actors and they either have careers together or careers separately there you see something if you if you are a talented person you can spot talent mm -hmm. so i i you know i think that if you try and break it down past that it's hard to get an explanation you know what was it i don't know it was it was like a feeling and i think that's true of artists like you you sort of like you just you just think you know maybe years later you can explain it but it's kind of an instinct unfortunately a lot of films have to do a lot of Mm, um, compromising a lot of, you know, when you're casting it to get money, to right, to it's the nature of filmmaking, thing, collaboration you know, you in certain people in that you that aren't based on the, those criteria that have, a, that they're based on other criteria 
So yeah. there could be issues and there often in inevitably are. Yeah. Well, again, the, the, the power shifts too. The power shifts. I mean, you know, making a film totally without resources on your own guerrilla filmmaking, there's every downside that you can think of. But the huge upside is that nobody has creative control but you. It mm. is nobody film. No, it is nobody's film but yours. Right. Once you start getting industry money, yeah. rightly so, as somebody who used to put industry money into films as an executive, rightly so, you're asking a company to expend meaningful resources that could be expended to other projects. There are criteria that right. are necessary in a business arrangement. And so there is a give and take, there is a healthy, necessary conversation about creative vision and desire and uh, market needs. And there is a sweet spot where they come together. And I think that when filmmakers come to the table with a kind of chip on their shoulder of like, you're gonna mess with me, that's not a healthy way to proceed. These are people who are there, they're on your side, they wanna make your movie. What's, what, what's not to like about that, right? Like, let's start with a positive appreciation of the opportunity you're being given. And what now let's be respectful of what your partner needs in order to, 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 to do right, to do what they want to do, which is to make mm -hmm. you. Right. You're in a unique position because you're, you're in that often might find yourself in, you know, helping that negotiation along on both ends. You're the one who's right in between. That's the job of a producer. The, what? what What you just said, that is the role of a producer. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's what it, a producer does. Right, and those fi potentially financing the film are looking to make a profit for the film, so they're going to come with all of the solutions or potential solutions for how to make a profit. The creative person wants the perfect actor for each role, the cinematographer who got that perfect look for what have you, right? The editor that edits their favorite films, <laughs> you know, that's what they're interested in. A smart filmmaker also wants their film to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> a smart filmmaker also wants actors who have market value. So I'm gonna hop forward many, many, many decades later after having been a kind of, I would say backseat driver um, as a creative executive, as a producer, sort of aiding and abetting, sort of handmaiden to other people's babies. Uh, um, I then stepped forward and I wrote and directed my own first feature, um, which is deeply personal. I also made it in the same way that we made Spanking the Monkey. I did it all on my own. I was then divorced. Um, it's a movie called Fly Away that we just referenced. Made that for a bit more, uh, but with more resources, more, again, LLC, investors at that point did have crowns, crowdfunding. So I was raised some of the money, not much through crowdfunding. There was a point in time where we were going to make that with a name value actor, a friend of mine who I'd known for many years. And at the last minute, uh, she got another job. And so we were confronted with the conundrum. Do we hit the pause button and try and drum up attention from someone else with market value? Or do we just make it maybe for a little less money, but with a good actor? And so we started down the path of you know knocking on agents' doors and would you read this? And I was like, I could spend the next five years of my life and not get this film made because there's no reason for them to say yes to this. This is, I'm a first time filmmaker. Again, it was a kind of a challenging personal movie. And um, it, there was just, if, you know, there's no personal relationship with me. It just wasn't gonna happen. And I did have a friend who was a wonderful actor um, who had done television. So, you know, she's a professional actor but she didn't have market value. And we made it and the film premiered at South by Southwest, this is a film flyaway that Reno played a small role in. Um, it premiered well, it was nominated for Best Dramatic Feature when it was at South by Southwest. It got, you know, reviews that my mother could have written, right, from New York Times, LA Times, yeah. you know, a downline variety. And it yeah. was, it was like, it was really a thrilling experience to, to be oh, so strongly and appreciated critically received. But the film never really found an audience and had it been cast with a market value actor, that would have been a different story. So I think that out there, if you have an opportunity to work with someone who will bring audience to your film, do it. Of course you want that. So, you know, there's, there's two sides to all of this. 
yeah i uh, i guess what happens potentially on the set that i could see as being a challenge is that you bring on a much more market value actor as you as you referred to the and then you as a first time director or second time director novice director let's say now the power shift issue is there potentially as well so you know they're going to come in and they're going to kind of you know own the set sure. unless you yeah. figure that out i mean that's a very challenging yeah and and i agree and uh, so adam you make mm -hmm. adam you make a very important point that is true that who owns the set right yeah. and if that actor who knows that the film is funded because of they have you know agreed to play the part right if they're arrogant if they abuse that power you're in trouble but one hopes that they're stepping forward because they support you they see something in you as a first-time filmmaker they want to be part of your venture and so that's where it's a lot about what attitude do you bring forth are you coming forth with insecurity? Like, <gasps> you know, I think that they, they know more than I do. And if you're threatened by them and intimidated yeah. and insecure, they're gonna smell it, you know, like yeah. a predator will smell prey. Actors want to be directed. Mm. Actors want a person with clear vision Confidence. to help, right? Because they're putting their, their career in your hands. Yeah. You have final say, you're gonna cut their, their performance together. No matter what they do, uh, in the in no matter what the footage is, ultimately you're going to make them look better or worse when you're in the editing room. So they want to know that you know what you're doing. So if you step into a, a scenario like that with great deal of insecurity and you're, you know, um, obstinate or aggressive, feel like you've got to prove something, things are going to go south fast. And um, so I think that you know, it's being a filmmaker is a, a lot about being a. a I tell you. A lot like being a mother. <laughs> okay. And it's certainly like being a psychologist in that you have to understand what are the needs and fears of the person in front of you. And how can you match and meet that and assure them? Think about the other person's point of view. Think about what they're afraid of. Think about what they want from this and work with that in relation to that. And then you create collaboration. I think this is true in any collaboration, in any relationship is reciprocity and you know if you go forth into the world always just asserting you and asserting your needs you know then you're trump um so, i cannot believe i have to have figured that out uh <laughs> tell me about your relationship with reggie hudlin you mentioned him earlier yeah House party films this is something that ended up being a very uh significant relationship in your professional life yeah. Well, you know, that was just good luck. It was good luck and good timing. Um, the way that that happened is that um, New Line was, and I think still is, big on sort of counter programming. Now, at that time, we were a scrappy independent company. It's become, it went from being a scrappy independent company. New Line has a very interesting trajectory. And uh -huh. I was privileged to be there for 10 years, <clears throat> watching a lot of that, you know, they're sort of on a big learning curve as the company was on a growth curve. So when I started, I was a grad student and I started as a reader while I was a grad student at NYU. And I was like a, 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 a script reader, right? I, I was like doing it part-time, et cetera. And then the company started to grow and they needed people to help. So they asked if I'd come in a few days off the, off the books, right? And help organize a script department. They didn't even have one uh, because at that time they were producing they had been just distributing. So they started just distributing. They're distributing kind of high art, low art, uh, John Waters movies, French cinema, and their reliable B movies, what were used to be called drive-in movies, which are horror movies. And they've been doing pretty well on that. And by the way, horror movies is a genre, elevated horror particularly, is a very uh, reliable way to get started as an independent filmmaker. Look at Ari Aster, right? With Heredity and- There's and a built-in- um, audience almost, or a genre film. That's why, right. So a genre film, a certain kind of genre, the reason that that's a good entree, that filmmakers ha often have opportunities is because it's not execution dependent, right? So I was saying before, those sort of personal vision auteur films are execution dependent. If the filmmaker doesn't have the talent that you hope they do, you got nothing. Nobody wants to see it. If you make a horror movie and it's not the greatest thing in the world, there's still some way that you can and this is a business term, exploit the resource, right? 
So when you're looking as an investor to put money in, you got to know what's your chance of getting it out. So a genre that has a certain reliability, like a horror movie, just deliver enough thrills and enough blood and gore. Hit them more. Hit them more. That's right. Right. But, and then of course, if like it's better not. than that, like you've got an Ari Oster, right? When it's, if it's yeah. better than that, you've got a Wes Craven. So at the time, and we're talking about the late eighties, New Line Cinema had been distributing these kinds of films and they decided that they would actually fund one. So they were busy in post-production funding a, a, a an, um, horror movie that, for, that they had fully funded, right? And they were going to distribute and it was in post-production and the word on the street was, hey, it's pretty good. So people started to submit a lot of scripts for consideration saying, would you produce mine now? Now that you're not just a distributor, but also a production entity, will you also produce mine? And so they needed somebody to start helping to read all these scripts and enter me. So there I was reading a lot of these scripts and there was this kid who was working um, on his off hours. He was an undergrad at NYU and he was working off hours in the back room. He was a film inspector after school. We started talking, I liked him a lot. I said, hey, would you help me to read the scripts? That was Ted Hope. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Really? And uh, yeah, I mean, we all grew up together. I mean, sure. we, we did. We truly grew up That's together. So funny. Yeah. You know, then one day I, sh I show up in my office and um, there was this NYU intern who was like this kid who was very, very, very uh, phenomenally shy. And, you know, it was like a, a, a comic book, book nerd and, uh, and very brilliant. That was Mike DeLuca. So Mike DeLuca was my intern. <laughs> Ted Hope was in the back <laughs> film inspecting. <laughs> <laughs> one of the many producers that was kicking around town that I was like, you know, having lunch with because he was so smart. He was this kid who was in, he had done some, you know, he was highly esoteric from Stanford and, you know, it was the smartest guy I ever met whose talent ranged from high to low and was wanted to produce and that was James Seamus. So I said, huh, you know, you should meet, the, there's this other guy I know and he, he seems to have okay. the same taste range. So you, so you, introduced were, you played uh, matchmaker yeah. for Ted and James. Yeah. Right. We, all, I, I, we all went out to lunch and said, you guys should work together. There's something here. And they went yeah. on, of course, to, to like the, have an illustrious the, birth. Yeah, the Zelig of the uh, independent film world, it turns out. The Zelig, <laughs> <laughs> Zelig of independent film. Well, right. well for, for a short period of time. Anyway, so, so let, me, let me keep going because I'm getting Please. on tangents here. But so, so anyway, so, so there I was, you know, reading scripts with Ted Hope helping me. And the film gets released that was in post-production at New Line Cinema. And of course, it was Nightmare on Elm Street. And then everything changes fast and the company starts going to, to acquire and, dis and produce more and more films. It starts growing and I am there for the next 10 years where it goes from being this scrappy independent company that only distributed to a company that distributed and produced, right. uh, which is known as a mini major, to then making a deal with, uh, with Ted Turner, Turner Broadcasting for a huge, huge infusion of capital becoming a mini major of much bigger consequence. When Time Warner was, when, when uh, Turner Broadcasting was acquired by Time Warner and it became Warner Brothers, this is after I left, shortly after I left, New Line folded into Warner Brothers and now is only a production division at Warner Brothers. So New Line Cinema no longer is a distributor, is no longer a studio, it is a production entity within the studio of Warner Brothers. So Warner Brothers was starting, would be the distributor then, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. So anything today, currently, that New Line Cinema develops and produces is a Warner Brothers project. So it's, it's like a, a division of Warner Brothers, but just for production. Anyway, but going back then, um, and so, so we knew that we, we're talking about late 80s, early 90s, that we, New Line Cinema, had a few categories where that kind of counter program. We went where the studios didn't, right? We were a scrappy little company. We're not going to go neck and neck with a major that making $100 million movies for international release with big stars. That's not our lane. What was our lane? Our lane was to do genre films mm -hmm. that worked well for specific audiences. Now, an audience that is really a big, big fan base for horror movies is Black urban youth. So this was our audience. We already had a relationship with the Black urban youth. And so we started to think, well, what other kinds of movies could feed our audience? Enter Reggie Hudlin. My assistant at the time, who was also an NYU student, um, was dating him. And she brought in her boyfriend's short <laughs> that he had made when he was in a senior in Harvard. And it was, 
you know, very, very talented short film about a bunch of kids in uh, East St. Louis mm -hmm. having like a night on the town. It was house party as a short. <clears throat> so he came in and he and his brother Warrington Hudlin, who was his producer, uh, came in and we started talking and they had a, a different script that didn't quite connect. Uh, it was a, a, a different premise. And I said, well, how about doing a feature version of House Party? And they said, well, we don't really have a script. I said, we just have a treatment. So show me the treatment. So I looked at it and said, I'll tell you what, I don't have the ability to take this treatment and your short and get you a production deal, but here's what I can do. I and my small staff will work with you off you know, on, on after hours on our own time right. to help you develop this yeah. into a screenplay. And then we will walk the package in. And so that's what we did for the next couple of months. It was funny because we would meet in the conference room and it had a big whiteboard and we'd, you know, different color code out different through lines of different characters. And I remember Bob Shea walking through and looking at the board saying, people really do that? <laughs> it's like, yeah, people really do that. And um, and then the script was terrific and uh, we brought it in, but here's the thing, weekend read. So I've got the script, I've got Reggie's short film, which back then was a you know video cassette that you had to look at. And um, now because we were New Yorkers, now I wanna make clear and remind everybody that we were the New York uh, office of a company right. that started in New York, but over these years had grown, 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 grown and now had an LA office, but I stayed home. I stayed in New York. So I was kept running and I kept with all of my, you know, my crew, the people that I knew in the New York indie film world, some of whom I've just said really interesting, exciting stuff was happening, was bubbling to the surface. And I'm a New Yorker and I don't want to leave and I didn't like LA, blah, 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 blah. So I stayed behind and I kept, you know, I sat on the, the, the eggs in the nest in New York while they were out there doing all of their LA stuff. Weekend Read comes along and all of us, us being my small staff, we knew what hip hop was because we rode the subways because we were New Yorkers. We knew, we knew, we, we feel the thrum of the city that this was a thing. LA, in LA, you go from your house to your car, to your office, to your screening room and home. It's a totally insulated, isolated kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't know what hip hop was. And again, now we're talking about 1989. So it just so happened that either Newsweek or Time had done a story about hip hop. So we Xeroxed the articles about this is what it is. Hip hop is like a thing. We put it in the packet with the copy of the script. Now this is all, this is pre-digital. So everything's you know physical manual with the, the video cassette and we shipped it out for weekend read. And, um, and you know, Bob and company signed on and we made the film for about a million. I think it was like 1.3. And, um, and the rest is history. It grows 26 million and, and, uh, and became a cult classic and the rest is history. But again, it's thinking about a niche. It spawned two sequels. It became, it became what's called the franchise, which every production company or studio wants is these right. sort of ten poles. So you have steady revenue stream. You want right. your franchise to get steady, reliable running uh, so that you have the money to invest in other films and filmmakers. If right. you don't have those franchise tent poles, every time out you're gambling the farm and it makes you more cautious and less able to, to help new films and filmmakers. I say it spawned two sequels, but in fact, you could argue that it, since it was a, you know, a, not really, a, it's, it spawned a lot of films some, in, a, in that, it kind of created a little bit of, so the genre in of itself yeah. so yeah. so it spawned uh, um, yeah. a lot of copycats i guess right or i'd like to say legacy a legacy of a certain kind of what one of the things that impressed me when i read it is that there were a lot of kind of you know crime stories and drug stories and you know right. like inner city yes. bad kind of stories this was a john hughes movie right back to well, yeah and yes. i thought this is so refreshing first of all it was Tremendously talented. It jumped off the page at you. He was, it was so charming. But, but I feel like, hey, you know, black kids are kids too. And this is widening, right, widening the parameter yeah. of how we understand each other. The whole genre of rap and the or origins of hip hop came from house parties. They were, right. they were parties and the kids were, you know, they, they would have 
contests and they would just it was it was all meant and it was out of joy and there was dancing and and yeah. from there you know um uh from there came rap and then rap kind of spawned a subgenre of rap which was more uh gangster hard edged yeah and, right you know yeah uh but but the yeah. origins of it right. um were exactly what this film was about or mm -hmm. you know came from absolutely um, so that so that's that that's and that that's that's back then this is now so here we are now in 2021 facing yet another iteration and reinvention of independent film and I, you, you and I were having a conversation when we went walking my dogs and I know we've only got 15 minutes left but I think we want to jump into talking about where do we go from here and the big challenges that face the independent community and they're huge because um you know independent filmmaking has been on life support for quite some time and it's like it's flatlining now and here's why because yes there's more content and content viewing as we're all home in covid right, right. We're all watching everything that we can but what are we watching we're watching huge branded content that's star driven that's heavily merchandised that's heavily marketed by a few platforms that are the new studios netflix hulu Amazon. These are now the studios. Why? Because the definition of a studio is the company that can produce, develop, and distribute story. So, and by the way, they're also doing episodic. So there's not even a subsidiary distribution deal to, made, to be made with a cable station. It is a monopoly. And so they are, as you notice in the, the um, Golden Globes, 23 nominations went to Netflix. Everybody's like, there's no double digits after that. Mm -hmm. Any company that's getting nominations is not even getting 10 nominations. I mean, they're so ahead of the pack. They are the leading studio. But what is it that, what's the business model for a streamer? It's totally different. It used to be that you'd fund a movie according to revenue, right? And revenue model, what does that mean? That means that you look at what are the elements, what's their market value, What's your prediction of how it will do in the marketplace in various territories for various kinds of rights in various territories? And what's the budget? Does it equate? You move forward. If the budget is higher than the estimated revenue stream, you don't get funded. So you'd look at things like genre, cast, director, director's track record, period piece, costs of it, you know, what are the, the budgeting costs? Then you say, is what how is this like? enough like films of its category that people will recognize and want to see it, but different enough to be, to, to, to feed an appetite, doesn't just feel you know, redundant and stale. And then what territories around the world like this kind of film or these kinds of actors? And that what are the uh, distribution streams within that? Can you sell it to television? Can you sell it you know, theatrical? You know, there used to be such a thing as a DVD sales, right? Things like that. Okay, all of that has shifted. Now, there's no more DVD sales, everything's streamed. Theatrical has disappeared because of COVID, who knows if it's gonna come back. Your only real reliable revenue source is a streaming platform. Mm -hmm. And streamers don't care about the revenue of a particular film. They care about subscription uh, retention, and retention. So they wanna acquire and retain subscribers. They want people who will feel that it is necessary to pay a monthly fee. Right, of is your project something that's going to be sticky enough and attractive enough that people feel compelled to get that Amazon account or to keep that Amazon account? And the, that which is most sticky for streamers are episodics. They get you hooked. They're selling you crack. I have a Hulu subscription for one reason only, Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> right? That's my version of crack. Right? And on and on and on. So if you have a one project versus an episodic a series that you're going to bring people in and keep them there. You've got one story to tell, and that story is small, doesn't have stars, has had festival life maybe. How sticky is it? How much interest are you going to get from a streamer for it? And how much revenue, if they do acquire it, will they give you in advance for it? Very, very, very little. So it's really hard. It always was hard, but it's much harder now for an independent film to find people who say, yes, I'm gonna get my money out, so I'm gonna put my money in. 
And this is a real challenge moving forward for the independent filmmaker. How are they going to get their stuff done? And I don't know. I mean, I, I teach at NYU, as I mentioned before. And, you know, this is a question that I posit to my students and say, this is your future. <laughs> I can tell you about what brought us to here. You're going to figure, have to figure out how to get from here. Right. It is very, very unclear how they will, now that festivals have gone online, um, it just doesn't attract it's as much it's attention. It's hard to guess how festivals will manage in the new world that we're looking at. Yeah. You know, because because it the ones that have been able to hold on, um, and I'm not talking about the, the big two or three, well, you know, in me, Toronto, uh, Sundance, uh, Tribeca, these festivals, you know, they've got a lot of uh, money. Uh, but even those festivals have to deal with probably in a significant drop in people traveling to them. Yeah, so, so for know, sure, festivals are going to keep an online component. Sure. I mean, the good news yeah. is that the, the, the work has become more accessible when it's digit digitized. There are more people all over the world who can view and attend. And I think Sundance did very well, but Sundance is an exception to every rule. It's the star, right? It's, right. It's, all the other festivals have had big drop off. So when and if we're able to go back in person, the venues will necessarily have fewer people in them because they'll it's it's hard to imagine how long it'll be before we can have pack a theater so and people travel in airplanes i mean it's really it's going to be years until people will function yeah. yeah just really in the way that is necessary to keep a film festival which is a live a celebration event going and the other downside is that that they were like conferences there were opportunities for other people in the industry to see each other and meet each other and 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 also filmmakers to meet producers and to advance their career to the next level. Absolutely. Agents, representatives, talent, you know, seekers go sniffing around. When you're premiering your first feature online, you're not going to the cocktail parties, you're not meeting those agents. It's it's all very different. And that began that much harder. And it's gonna be a couple of years before those opportunities arise again. So, you know, again, this is a problem. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Thank you, Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So many people, so many industries. So yeah. many I mean, I do believe, and I think I'm not alone in this, that, you know, there's a, a tremendous hunger to yeah. have life oh. communal experience and that when we can, people will, I think, come rushing back. Oh, to absolutely. Those They'll come rushing yeah. back. The question yeah, I actually bounced this off of right, and I actually bounced this off of Michael Moore. I thought, you know, when theaters so many are shuttering or have shuttered or will probably have to shutter, but when but the the they'll never go away really because it, I think as as you were saying there's a is an such an enormous appetite for for at least some percentage of the movie uh, digesting uh, ingesting population to go to a theater to go see it like in that environment with other people. So, um, and that's not just me being nostalgic. I think, I mean, there's way too many people uh, exp expressing that, you know, yeah. and I'm tuned into it, that, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I think like independent theaters will probably be, come back before chains and in terms of any kind of significance. I mean- Yeah, I, I agree I, with that. I mean, I the revenue is different, so. No, no, I agree. I think that the people who are probably feeling the most homebound and hungering the most are people who live in cities. And as soon as we can start going to, uh, going out of our homes and gathering communally, we will. And I, uh, we're also culturally habituated. I mean, why do you live in New York if you're not a culture vulture, right? You know, what? why be there? Why be in these packed surroundings if you can't enjoy the vitality of what the city offers? So. I also think that the direction that movie theaters, art house theaters have been going will become that much more clear, which is cultural event centers and movies are a part of it. There'll be restaurants, they'll have, you know, a curated screenings, they'll bring filmmakers, they'll have- Much more than ever before. Much right. more than ever before to, to compel people to have that experience. Yeah. And also because it will be quite some time before you can pack a house. I would easily imagine that theaters will open at limited capacity, right? the way that restaurants are opening at limited capacity. So you have to 
create more reason or, or, or to increase the price of the ticket too. So if you have, let's say 50% seating, then you have to have a 50% increase in the ticket price to equal the revenue stream you got when you could 100% seat. So, but if you add in bells and whistles, like instead of spending $10, what would you spend $20 for? Well, maybe if there's a chance to have a live Q and A with the filmmaker digitally, where they're going to serve you, you know, special drinks, you know, first drink is on the house or something like that. There'll be, yeah, there's going to be a lot of creativity going in and into answering that question. Yeah. Right. Or, or into that equation to solve that problem. Yeah. Solve that problem. Um, it could be, it could be a very interesting time for movie lovers um, in that, in that, in that sense. Yeah, right. Um, They're more, more like like you'll be seeing a sort of a film festival. Maybe you'll be a subscriber base. Right. They, they played with that in a lot of theaters, especially in smaller cities and smaller towns, where it's a subscription based. Yeah, uh, well, model. Like the loyalty program, you know, uh, building on that idea, which right. I think is a great idea. I, you know, we have upstate films up here, and you mm -hmm. know, I don't know if they're surviving or not, but I would love to yes. help in any way possible. I'm so. Yeah. So um, dedicated, committed to yeah. if, 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 if there is a chance to do whatever I can do, you know, with my little tiny right. platform. Yeah, to have sort of like a, a, a curated series where there's interviews with the filmmakers live digitally on the screen afterwards. It's so that you're kind of attending sort of like Friday Night Film Festival curated yeah. by, you know, Film Wax Presents a Friday Night Film Festival of that could be like a little film history, not just contemporary, but, you know, maybe you do a series of on, on one filmmaker, maybe you do a Spike Lee series or you do a, you know, whatever. It would right. be great. Then there's a, I, and, and a thing that, to, I was just gonna say that adversity is the mother of creativity. Yes, right. right. So it could be very, very, I agree with you. I think it can, yeah. it can be an incredibly creatively fecund period, but not without challenges. So we'll see. Um. We're in a lucky kind of lo location up here too. I mean, uh, you know, I think this particular area as a sidebar, you know, I think we're in a good location oh, in this yeah. part of the state, you know. Um, yeah. This is like having a master class, by the way. You, you, you mentioned, we mentioned a couple of times that you uh, teach at NYU. If you're considering film schools, I mean, this should put the, you know, should kind of seal the deal. You've got Janet Grillo teaching, <laughs> producing and uh, at, at, at uh, NYU. So I just want to put in a plug for, because I, I do feel like I am, you know, tribe NYU. And there is a kind of a weird loyalty that breeds. I did my graduate work there. I did my undergraduate at Wesleyan. I did not study. Right. Wesleyan has a great film program. I didn't take one film class when I was there. It was all about theater. Uh, oh yeah, 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 circle in the square was. Is that the right? Is that right from in your past too? You you yeah. Uh, circle, circle repertory theater. Company. Circle repertory. Excuse yeah. me. So it was it was later after I graduated Wesleyan as a theater gal. I right. went to New York City and I I did what's called the dramatic writing program at NYU grad program, which is this film and playwriting and TV writing, and I went there solely interested in theater and I worked at Circle Repertory Theater Company in the literary department while there. And that's when I started to think, huh, this movie thing is interesting. <laughs> I can see it. And so it kind of shifted over the years into film. Um, but the point is, so I was never at NYU film school proper. Uh, I learned on the job, right? Yeah. That film I learned on the job. But I want to say that um, I'm in the undergraduate film and television program at NYU. I don't teach in the grad program. I teach in the undergraduate program. And I think it's superb. Um, over the years, NYU has been, the, the criteria for enrollment has become higher and higher and higher. So the, I have to, I, I honestly believe we have the creme, creme de la creme. I mean, our students are brilliant. They're very well prepared. They're academically gift, you know, gifted and rigorous as well as being creatively, mind-blowingly talented and, and hardworking. And it's a really rigorous program. It's also a liberal arts program so that you know, you're benefiting from the extraordinary liberal arts that are uh, taught at the New York University, the large university, and you're doing a rigorous four-year training in visual storytelling. I mean, we're really thinking it not as film, but visual storytelling because the modalities are so shifting. And great colleagues, it's a wonderful time. It's a strong community. Name a couple of your colleagues that you worked in, in, in undergrad. 
in undergrad. Well, many of you will know Sam Pollard. His current film is MLK. A regular MLK. listener of this show, he's been on here like five times. So ah, well, Sam's you know fantastic. Uh, Louis Erskine, who's also a documentary filmmaker and, and editor, um, who's popping to mind. Um, Enid Zentelis, who had two films that were at Sundance and actually has a really interesting podcast coming out now. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm overlooking so many wonderful colleagues right now. It's so hard to put on the spot. Um, but it's, it's, it's a group of very talented, dedicated professionals who care and know what they're doing. But the most important thing about going to NYU is, are, is your peer group. And you know, we always say this to our students, but it's true, is like, look to your right, look to your left, that's your future. It's that's not that one of you or both two of you will be gone. No, it's that the end of the program. You, one or two of you is gonna be like the next big thing, stay together. Yeah, exactly. this, is, this, is, this is, you are gonna move forward as pods, as generations into a, a network that's very interconnected people for example, every year at Sundance Film Festival, Tish owns it, right? 80% of the films that premiered at Sundance this season had a Tish element to them. 80%. Tish had and their hands. Somebody, up. right. There was somebody involved with Tish. Somebody who came out of Tish who was involved in it in some way. Um, and, um, you know, so there you go. Yeah, so now more than ever is these connections that are going to be crucial to everybody more than ever I mean obviously yeah. so networking and doing right. things together because it's a collaborative medium and and trying to figure out how how right. yeah what's right. the pathway forward and right. that's that's a lot about community and collectivism you know we, we encourage collaboration and collectivism even though there's a lot about the auteur in our program really it's about understanding nobody does this alone urging, uh, one way is potentially urging Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, these companies you talk, we've talked about to reinvest, you know, in, in, in these new, new, new generations of filmmakers and in yeah. like these festivals and into the, yeah. you know, exhibition well, film. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, of course they do. All of these companies underwrite Sundance, right? All of these companies give grants and such. What's going to make it their financial worth their financial while to put real resources in your film? Sure, yeah. That's a business proposition. You know, they're they're not philanthropists. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have big grant giving organizations to protect our filmmaking like they do in Europe. We don't have the, you know, the British Council Film Fund. We're we we don't. So you know, an NEA no longer gives to individual filmmakers. So. You know, well, you got to figure out. You got to make a strong business argument. You have to be. You have to be a grown up. Yeah. You have to say. You know, you're asking somebody well, to put some. This is a sec. Another. Another. Our. Our. This will be in our follow up podcast, but uh, which we'll do down the line a little bit. But but, you know, the country maybe is positioned to move forward towards maybe where we will have arts endowments again in a more robust. Uh, I mean, possibly. Yeah, I, I mean, would be saying Medicare for all might be a higher priority, <laughs> but right behind that, I say let's let's support the arts, United States. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, thank you. What a what a great! I knew it would be terrific. And <laughs> you are terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to just blab blab blab. <laughs> oh no! Listen. I'm hoping, you know, if anything, maybe you've, you've uh, you'll have uh, an impact on some young minds who are trying to figure out where they're going to go to undergraduate school, <laughs> if nothing else. If, if nothing else, if nothing else. But, um, I'll look forward to a walk uh, in a couple of weeks when. That's good. When we're out of the teens. When we're, right. Although right. I don't care. A nice brisk walk. Um, and this one is always good. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam. Thanks for, for inviting me. It's been fun. And, um, you know, we'll see you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a great day. You too.